Buenas tardes. Por favor, cierren las puertas para que nadie más salga. Muy bien, buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Marco Antonio Rito Palomares y soy el director del Instituto de Investigación sobre Obesidad. Pero el día de hoy realmente estoy muy, muy eh, honrado de presentar a nuestro siguiente conferencista. Quizás antes de hablar eh, sobre nuestra siguiente conferencista, quisiera darle las gracias a la audiencia presencial, pero también, por supuesto, a quienes nos acompañan de manera eh, virtual. Eh, la siguiente conferencista es la doctora Linda Manzanilla, y debo decir y confesar que cada vez que tengo oportunidad de escuchar su plática, son realmente fascinantes. Para alguien, quizás de las ciencias biológicas, el ver cómo la ciencia tiene aplicación para entender nuestra historia es increíble. Entonces, realmente eh, debo dar las gracias a la doctora Linda Manzanilla y me siento honrado de presentar su siguiente eh, plática, que estoy seguro les va a dar una perspectiva completamente diferente del lema que hemos estado manejando, de Science in Action. Pero Science in Action para algo quizás diferente a lo que como TEC estamos acostumbrados. Estoy seguro que les va a fascinar. Y quizás sin mayor preámbulo, eh, les invito a conocer a la doctora Manzanilla a través de esta breve semblanza. Linda Rosa Manzanilla Naim. Es arqueóloga por la Escuela Nacional de Antropología e Historia, maestra en Ciencias Antropológicas por la UNAM y doctora de tercer ciclo en Egiptología por la Universidad de París IV Sorbonne, investigadora del Instituto de Investigaciones Antropológicas de la UNAM y miembro del Colegio Nacional. Es autora de 32 libros y 220 artículos sobre temas relacionados con las sociedades urbanas tempranas en Mesoamérica, Mesopotamia, Egipto y la región andina. Su línea de investigación privilegia la articulación interdisciplinaria para avanzar en el conocimiento sobre el estudio de la vida doméstica en los primeros desarrollos urbanos. Con la articulación de la arqueología con la paleobotánica, la palinología, la paleozoología, la química, la física, la geofísica, geología, la osteología y la genética. Es investigadora emérita del Sistema Nacional de Investigadores. Ha recibido diversos reconocimientos como el Premio Alfonso Caso del INA, el Premio de Investigación del Shanghai Archaeology Forum, entre otros. Es doctora honoris causa por la UNAM y por la Universidad Nacional de San Cristóbal de Huamanga. Demos la bienvenida a Linda Manzanilla. research in an exceptional city in Mexico, in ancient Mexico, Teotihuacan. There are many types of cities in Mesoamerica. There are some constructed in mountains, uh, others that are dispersed cities, such as the ones we see in the Maya area. Uh, other types of cities are uh, different from Teotihuacan. They are very uh, well planned and very densely constructed, but Teotihuacan was the first orthogonal city in Mesoamerica. That is a city with an urban grid at, at right angles. It was the first in Mesoamerica and Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital was the last. Due to an eruption of the Popocatépetl volcano around the first century of the Christian era, a lot of people fleeing from the, the sites uh, devastated by the eruption uh, came to the valley of Teotihuacan. Uh, the city they constructed 
was one of the largest pre-industrial cities in the ancient world. Here you see the basin of Mexico and the volcanoes and the urban sprawl of Teotihuacan. It was uh, a city of 20 square kilometers. Uh, as you see, most of the constructions and, and streets are at right angles. And of course, it is a, a fascinating city, a city that articulates the constructed the pyramids and sites with the natural environment. There is a harmonious uh, visual effect. And it was a city constructed to the four quarters of the universe as the Mesoamerican cosmos was imagined. <clears throat> In the periphery of the site, you see what I called the ethnic neighborhoods. People from Oaxaca, constructed the Oaxaca Barrio. A small enclave of people from Michoacán are in the western part of the city. And in the eastern part, you see people from Veracruz, from the Gulf Coast of Mexico. <clears throat> These ethnic neighborhoods can be detected uh, because they uh, recreate their funerary rituals as they did in their regions of origin. Each ethnic group has the liberty to uh, do their ritual as they do in their places of origin. The people from Veracruz are the only ones that were allowed to construct circular huts with adobes uh, as they did in their region of origin because the rest of the people living in the city, uh, uh, as, as you saw in the map, are living in multifamily apartment compounds. The people from Oaxaca uh, built their tombs as they do in Monte Alban. People from Michoacán bring objects, but also uh, recreate the tomb shafts as they do in Michoacán. And the foreign ethnic groups, because this is one of the exceptional characteristics of Teotihuacan, multi-ethnicity. Multi a lot of people coming from different parts of Mesoamerica are living together in the site. And these people who are foreign are also depicted in figurines and in mural paintings. They are very different from the Teotihuacanos. What I uh, see is that the city was uh, divided in four districts. Each district was headed by a lord uh, with an emblem, a different emblem. In each of the districts, you have the different neighborhoods. Uh, and each neighborhood has a coordination center. The, coordinate, the neighborhoods are the most dynamic part of Teotihuacan society. Each neighborhood center uh, promotes a weekly market in uh, the barrio where local resources are, uh, are in, uh, exchanged through barter. But also the elite that heads each neighborhood organizes caravans to different parts of Mesoamerica to bring foreign raw materials and goods. Local uh, people who produce uh, things in the basin of Mexico live in villages. And Teotihuacan is the only great city in all the basin of Mexico. To each of the neighborhood uh, market, weekly market, come local fauna or local products, uh, such as fauna from the region, flora uh, that uh, are eaten by the, uh, the people of each neighborhood, mostly the Mesoamerican diet, but also obsidian from two sources and materials, volcanic materials to build and rebuild the city. But each neighborhood promotes alliances to a particular corridor of ally sites and a particular region of Mesoamerica. Each one heads in a different direction. So I have called 
the Teotihuacan state, state, an octopus type of state, where the city is the head of the octopus and each neighborhood promotes alliances for, uh, through corridors of sites to different parts of Mesoamerica. From those regions outside the basin of Mexico come to Teotihuacan, uh, marine fish, come crocodile, uh, crabs, foreign fauna, and also uh, marine mollusks from the different oceans. The Gulf Coast of Mexico, the Caribbean, and the Pacific, but also cotton cloths from Veracruz. Uh, in the city of 125,000 people, a lot of people are part of the elite, and the elite wears cotton garments. And these cotton cloths come from Veracruz. And also uh, come uh, pigments from different uh, regions who are, which, uh, which uh, are not local pigments like cinnabar or malachite, parasite, galena, and also slate from Morelos Guerrero, travertine from Puebla, serpentine from Guerrero and Puebla, and jade from the Mayan area. The ruling elite, the ruling elite of Teotihuacan controls only two types of foreign raw material. Mica, which comes from Oaxaca, and jade from the Motagua Valley in uh, Guatemala. The people in the cities, especially the labor, the people who are working in the city live in apartment compounds. In uh, a series of compounds that house different families co-residing as a corporate group in a, in a compound. I excavated one of these multifamily apartment compounds in the northwestern periphery of uh, Teotihuacan. Through three years of excavation, we could un unveil uh, an, a, an, a small apartment compound uh, for three families of masons, masons who produce lime and who are uh, finishing the floors and the walls. Each family lives in an apartment. The three families co-reside as a corporate group in the apartment compound. Even though they are low class, they have access to this type of sumptuary goods in the, uh, in the city. And one of the families was the most important, the one that has the most uh, uh, large cult uh, courtyard. Each family venerates a different patron god. That is why the apartment compounds house families that are not kin, are not related through kinship. Uh, and this contrasts a lot with what I have seen in the Mayan area. The, the Maya live with uh, families that are, are, are related through kinship because they venerate a, a, a ancestors that are common to all the extensive family. So uh, the most uh, important part of all this uh, very dynamic society is the neighborhood. Each neighborhood has a coordination center. And the coordination center is surrounded by uh, apartment compounds of the corporate group. I excavated one of these coordination centers in the Southeastern periphery. And what you see in the neighborhood centers is that um, there are different uh, functional sectors in this area. So 13 field seasons we excavated, and excavated a lot of all this uh, compound. And we could see that these are very different compounds uh, as we saw the apartment compounds of the corporate group. These are places where decisions are taken, where rituals are done, where work for the neighborhood is uh, functioning. So what I saw is that the ritual area of each coordination center is very large, but we also have, for example, a very specialized uh, craft production se sector 
We also have military quarters, we have kitchens and storerooms uh, in an alignment to the north to give uh, the rations, the food rations to the workers. And of course, we could see with uh, radiocarbon dating and archaeomagnetic dating four different construction levels in, in this uh, neighborhood center. In it, in the 19th century, uh, uh, a, a beautiful mural painting appeared where you see two priests doing a, pla a planting ceremony towards an altar. And of course, the altar is in the neighborhood center. And this ritual plaza is where this ceremony is taking place. We have the representations of gods. We have the place where the ceremony is taking place and also the actions with the mural painting. And through chemical analysis of the stock of lore, we could easily follow the steps of each of these um, and, uh, priests coming towards the altar, coming up the temple, down the temple to the north, to the south, to the east and west. They are throwing organic liquids with salvia seeds, and we could find with phosphate analysis the uh, organic liquids as well as they are eroding the calcium carbonate of the floor, of the stock of floor, by walking to and fro uh, with their sandals. And there are also, of, of course, this ritual is very Teotihuacan, is very local. But in Teopancasco, we also have foreign rituals, such as the dismemberment of 29 uh, adult uh, individuals, putting each head in a, a bowl and topped with an, uh, another uh, plate or bowl. And this is a ritual that comes from the Mistequilla in Veracruz. Uh, this is a foreign ritual that we find in this part of the compound. Uh, uh, this uh, foreign ritual is a termination ritual of the three, 350 AD. That is the end of the first phase of Teotihuacan. 2,000 years later, there is another abandonment ritual in uh, another construction level, which is related to the great fire of Teotihuacan. Here we see the desecration of the cult uh, uh, objects, the fire god and the thunder god. And uh, we will talk about this, this revolt that set on fire the central part of Teotihuacan later on. The administrative component of each neighborhood has to do with stamped seals, you see, different uh, representations in the seals, as well as tortilla representations for food rations for each workers. And, and we have, there is no doubt that these are representations of tortillas, of maize tortilla, because we have them represented in theater type sensors together with maize, with squash, with uh, squash flowers, with tamales, and other food. Uh, and also, we have a lot of fauna coming from the Gulf Coast, from Veracruz, from the region of Nautla, because this particular uh, neighborhood center has a relation to the ocean, but not any ocean, to the ocean in Veracruz, in the Nautla region from where 14 types of marine fish come to the neighborhood. The craft production uh, area of the neighborhood center has to do with garment making, and they are uh, precisely doing this type of attire and this type of headdress. We have the instruments, we have the evidences of uh, cotton fibers. We also have the uh, facial portions of mammals uh, cut to be uh, set in the uh, headdress, and also the different uh, conch shells, uh, incrustations that are set in the cotton mantas. We also have 
baskets and nets that are being um, crafted in the in the neighborhood center and the layering of pottery to uh, look like the orange laker of Veracruz. They are imitating also pottery from Veracruz. In the northern part of the compound, we see the alignment of kitchens where we also did the chemical analysis of floors. And we see that, that the kitchens are very dirty because they are, well, they are working to uh, produce the food rations and the liquids fall and also uh, ashes fall and they uh, enrich the stock of floors with different elements. The southwestern portion of the neighborhood center is related to the military personnel that acts like a police of the neighborhood. It's the neighborhood police. The, uh, what we have done to understand who is who in this multi-ethnic environment is to, to do an interdisciplinary, a, a particular interdisciplinary project related to the burials. We see burials that are uh, set in a Teotihuacan manner. And all, there are also other individuals that are set in foreign ritual. For example, this is the head of a, uh, a female coming from elsewhere in Mesoamerica, and the head is surrounded by the long bones. This is not a Teotihuacan ritual. And also what, what we were talking about, these decapitated individuals set in craters or vessels and topped with other vessels. This is a Mistequilla uh, ritual coming from Veracruz. With uh, stable isotope analysis, trace element analysis, and strontium uh, isotope analysis in different institutes of uh, my university, we could understand that a, a group of those individuals buried in Teopancasco had uh, a marine component in the diet. Uh, versus other group, uh, another group has a terrestrial uh, diet, uh, and, 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 a, a di uh, and you see differences in the individuals, so they are not eating the same. As but as you see, the ones that are re uh, eating a marine diet are very few. Most of the workers with stable isotopes are being fed with food rations on maize, atoles, tortillas, tamales, and also domestic animals fed with maize, turkeys, and dogs. And here you see the, some of the dogs and some of the turkeys that are clustered together with most of the workers fed with maize. With oxygen isotopes, we could understand who are the burials that come from the coast, who are the ones coming from a lower uh, altitude from Dan Teotihuacan, but not the coast, who are the ones that are local from the basin of Mexico and the Puebla Tlaxcala Valley, and also who for individuals that come from higher altitudes than Teotihuacan. As you see here, with strontium isotopes, we could, uh, with uh, the Institute of Geophysics uh, at my university, we could see who are the individuals that come from afar, are migrants coming from afar. Other individuals are migrants, but come from, the, uh, from Puebla, Tlaxcala, Hidalgo, and other people are local, and these, uh, uh, are different techniques to understand the migrants of Teotihuacan. Through uh, an osteological analysis of activity markers in their uh, skeletons, we could see who are the individuals that are crafting the garments of the elite, who are the ones who are softening fibers with their teeth, who are the ones that carry heavy weights with the Mecapalin coming uh, with the caravans to the Gulf Coast and back. And this uh, carrying of the weights compresses the first uh, 
a vertebrae and also originates a, an a activity marker in the occipital bone. In their, in their feet, you see also activity markers of the long distances that are, uh, that are uh, well. Also, we have three cases of uh, exostosis, uh, auditory exostosis, and perhaps one of the, of the causes of exostosis uh, is to dive in cold waters. Perhaps these are the individuals that brought the marine shells to the, uh, to the neighborhood center. And what you see with the paleopathological study is that most individuals had um, um, nutritional stress in their infancy. That is, this is why they came with the caravans to Teotihuacan because they were summoned by each neighborhood with the promise of being fed by the neighborhood system with the rations, food rations. And of course, if they were not uh, well fed in the regions of origin, they came as most migrants come to the great cities to have better living conditions. We could also understand that most of the uh, individuals had light cavities in their teeth, but five had severe problems. There is one case of facial paralysis also. And uh, some individuals had cranial deformation, which is not common in Teotihuacan, is the tabular oblique type of deformation, which is a, a foreign uh, practice. And there is also there are also practices of incrustation and dental mutilation, which are foreign. And with the Sindre Stab uh, in Irapuato, the Langevio Laboratory of Genomics, we did ancient DNA of, of in a sample of burials of Tepancasco. And what we see is that the four major haplogroups of Mesoamerica, haplogroup A. B, C, and D, the four are present in one neighborhood of Teotihuacan, stressing the biological diversity of this city and of this neighborhood in particular. With DNA, we sexed the babies, the newborn babies, with ha half of them, uh, 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 we, we sexed the males and females, and we also had their haplogroups of, of these newborn babies that died in birth, in childbirth. And with the forensic uh, people of my institute, we did some facial reconstruction of some of the individuals of the workers of Teopancasco. And you can, you can see in this slide that the profiles are very different and the, the deformations in their heads are different. And there was, uh, uh, and a child uh, that had a, around seven, a seven year old child with a tabular erect deformation, which was, was intended to become a military of the, of the neighborhood who died at, uh, at seven years of age, uh, who was uh, being fed as an adult, was being trained as a military uh, at seven years and he died he was buried as the Teotihuacan's uh, buried elite uh, people. So he was considered elite. Seashells from the Gulf Coast, the Caribbean, and the Pacific Coast were worked in the uh, in Teopancasco to be uh, uh, crafted in the garments because precisely this, this neighborhood center was the one that had the uh, relation, the symbolic, economic, and social relation with the Nautla region in Veracruz through this corridor. This is the tentacle of Teopancasco. This is the corridor of ally sites. And from there, of course, cotton fibers, but also different types of pottery, for example, the Laker pottery. Uh, and, and you can see that each neighborhood is enriching itself with very lavish uh, 
uh, objects to display and to compete with other neighborhoods. There are also vessels from Tlaxcala, uh, as this one from Puebla, uh, from Guerrero and Morelos, the granular ware, as well as slate and uh, serpentine. And what I think is that each neighborhood is a unit, is a semi-autonomous unit in Teotihuacan. The Teopancaspo neighborhood had an emblem, the fish, probably. It had a, an attire. It had uh, particular ceremonies and particular feasts, uh, uh, as well as uh, caravans towards the Nautla region. From there, they brought the cotton cloths and they promoted that only the elite of Teotihuacan wore cotton cloths. Most of the rest of the urban population uh, uh, wore agave fiber cloths. And we, we may imagine that the intermediate elite of Teotihuacan were the, uh, the people managing the neighborhood centers. They were intermediate elite. And we will uh, talk about, uh, just for a while, about the ruling elite. Teotihuacan society is very different from the Maya society. Maya society, Mayan urban centers are headed by one lord, considered divine. He is a god. But in Teotihuacan, we don't see the representations of these rulers. It is they, they are not clear in the archeological record. So I have proposed that there is a council of four core rulers coming from the four districts of Teotihuacan. These four core rulers have different emblems. They represent their districts. And the only re representation we have is the Las Colinas vessel, where we see the birds of prey, the uh, coyotes, the serpents, and even though this is uh, a person attired as the rain god, he, his emblem is the felin, the jaguar or the puma. And uh, many archaeologists have asked themselves, where are the palaces of the ruling elite? And none of the other examples that the archaeologists have posed uh, has uh, really proven to be the uh, places of the ruling elite. Since the, re the year, year 2000, I have excavated a huge palace, the Palace of Shala, uh, who, which may be an example of a palace of two of the four core rulers. It is located to the north of the Pyramid of the Sun. It is a huge five, 55,000 square meter palace with a, uh, an area uh, where the military patrol to prevent people that are not allowed to come inside the palace with a huge uh, uh, main uh, uh, plaza where two of the core rulers and the two female counterparts stood as their offices with a temple in the center. In the Southern Plaza, we have attached workers working for different things for the ruling elite. We have domestic quarters attached to uh, the mountain god uh, precinct. We have also a ritual tumulus with my a mica treasure. And here is the ritual, the, the main plaza of Shala with four equivalent uh, small pyramids located to the north, south, east, and west, each one devoted to a different deity. They are not temples. They are precincts for people uh, personifying the deity. For, for example, the uh, pyramid to the east is devoted to the thunder god. So the core ruler that stood there dressed himself as the thunder god. He had uh, uh, jaguars as an emblem. He had incense censers with uh, um, uh, rain pouring down. 
The structure to the north was devoted to feminine figurines, some of them pregnant, pregnant that is fertility related to uh, women and, uh, and of course uh, women in the domestic quarters have the fire god as their god. And uh, these are elements of fertility, uh, 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 ex, uh, po uh, uh, put in, in offerings in that uh, particular uh, structure. The structure to the south uh, is devoted to the mountain god. We see here in the Denver Art Museum the representation of the uh, uh, mountain god with the mountains, uh, an altar of mountains, which I uh, found in my excavations broken when the revolt towards the ruling elite came about and the fire, the great fire of the central portion of Teotihuacan. And because the mountain god has plants uh, and animal tails, so uh, it is the most, di uh, we found the most di diverse elements of flora in that particular place. The structure to the west is devoted to the deity, the goddess of waters, flowing waters. So we have also uh, offerings relating that goddess to fertility, but not human fertility, but water as an element of fertility. So what we see is that two of the co-rulers may have their offices here and their female counterparts in front. And there is a temple in the center where they can do their different rituals. And in the Southern Plaza, we have elements of, of different types of crafts, painters, people working with mica coming from Oaxaca, people crafting the garments of the ruling elite, insignia of the ruling elite, also uh, working in, even with elements that come from very early Maya iconography are found there. Also, they are working also with shell. And the uh, structure of the mountain god has the domestic quarters around it. And we have excavated these quarters. And what we see is that this seems to be an example of a palace of the ruling elite. Of course, we have not excavated the whole 55,000 square meters. But what we see is that around 570 in the Christian era, there is a revolt of the neighborhoods towards the ruling elite. And they burned all the places where the ruling elite stood around the street of the dead, the main north, uh, south axis. So uh, they were uh, they were beating the sculptures in many pieces, destroying, setting on fire the structures. The wooden beams of the roofs came down to the floors. All of this uh, were found uh, beaten into pieces, shattered in different pieces. And so uh, we see that there is a revolt. It's not an invasion of foreign people. There is a revolt towards the ruling elite. And many people fled from Teotihuacan after this great fire in 570. Little by little, all the Teotihuacanos fled the city because the supply system of the city collapsed. And from the Bajio region came other uh, groups, the Coyotlatelco people, to loot the city. Here, we, uh, there is a reminder of the urban sprawl of Teotihuacan, surrounded by villages of, produ of people producing. The uh, other place that, is, that may be called the ally of Teotihuacan is Monte Albán in Oaxaca. We see Teotihuacan elite bringing uh, uh, gifts to the ruler of Monte Albán. And by 378, we see a group of armed Teotihuacanos 
doing a coup d'etat in Tikal, uh, they uh, set a, a dynasty of Teotihuacanos in Tikal. The Maya lord died that day that they came. And these people are the, the group of the serpent, the, the district of the serpents, whose elite was banned from Teotihuacan. It seems that they wanted uh, not to uh, participate in a ruling council, but they, they wanted to do a coup d'etat in Teotihuacan and had all the political power by themselves. And they were evicted from Teotihuacan. And, and it is uh, probably these people that come armed, they killed the Maya Lord in Tikal, which was the other great city in the Maya region. And they, they installed a Teotihuacan dynasty. Of course, since this time onwards, the Maya became enemies of Teotihuacan. So what I have uh, uh, talked about is my view of this city, which is an exception in Mesoamerica, not only because it's one of the largest pre-industrial cities, uh, in the ancient world, a 20 square kilometer city, not only because of its urban grid, uh, which is, sets all the constructions in right angles, not only because it, it is a multi-ethnic society, uh, uh, which houses people from different parts of Mesoamerica, and, but because it has an organization, a corporate organization, in the base and in the summit, the core ruling council is a, a characteristic of the corporate society. The corporate groups of labor living in the apartment compound is also another characteristic of the corporate society. But in the middle, there is this competitive aspect of the neighborhood elites. That is the competing people, establishing uh, their alliances, uh, behaving semi-autonomously. And these people tore the uh, corporate tissue of the Teotihuacan society. And of course, if the Teotihuacan state wanted to control the excessive autonomy of the neighborhoods, the, the, this provoked the revolt towards the ruling elite and all the street of the dead compounds, ritual compounds, palaces, administrative buildings were burned. And the people of Teotihuacan had to leave the city. And the looters from the Bajio came and destroyed a lot of this uh, extraordinary city, but because it left no texts to understand how uh, it functioned, that is why we, there is no way out that uh, only with the interdisciplinary projects of science of the 21st century that we can unveil this exception. Thank you very much. Well, really, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alinda Manzanilla. As I anticipated, a very fascinating talk. And in the interest of time, I will allow one question from the audience. If not, then I have plenty myself. <laughs> Bueno, ah, Professor, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. My question is regarding if Teotihuacan lasted about a bit more than half a millennia, this thesis about the, uh, the four main deities being their center of organization, do you think it started since the beginning of, the, of Teotihuacan as such or it um, 
became at a middle point before it began. The, I mean, this, this space began decaying with all the sackings and so on. Now, uh, uh, thank you for your question. I, I believe because there are these four districts and three of the main pyramids of the site are the pyramids of three of the districts. The pyramid of the moon is the pyramid of the district of the birds of prey, of the eagles. It is not a pyramid for all the Teotihuacanos. It is a pyramid for the people of the northwestern district. The pyramid of the sun related to the rain god is the pyramid of the jaguars and, and pumas. That is the northeastern district. And the pyramid of the, uh, the feather serpent is the pyramid of the southeastern district. Why is there, uh, there not a pyramid in the southwestern district? Because most of those people were foreign, foreign people, not the original people building Teotihuacan, starting to construct this society. These are people coming from Michoacan, from Oaxaca, and uh, uh, perhaps not, um, not they, they were not given the same status as the groups, the factions that constructed the uh, first uh, uh, city in two, uh, 200 AD. So uh, what I see is that the core ruling council may have begun around 250 AD, but in 350, the serpent group was evicted because the uh, temple of the feather serpent that is the temple of those people, the faction of the serpents was destroyed by the Teotihuacan. Halfway in Teotihuacan history, the pyramid of the feather serpent was destroyed. The sculptures were torn from the pyramid. The pyramid was set on fire and another structure was built in front so you could not see the facade. So this is the destruction of a, a, the main temple of a faction. And these people of the uh, feather serpent were thrown from the city. What I think is that they wanted to have power by themselves in Teotihuacan. But the corporate organization of Teotihuacan, which uh, allowed only a council of lords, did not uh, want one dynasty to rule they wanted the council, a collective entity to have decision making, and they expelled the serpents from Teotihuacan. So at the end, the second uh, part of the Teotihuacan history, there were three factions in the council only. Well, really, once again, thank you very much. Um, Professor Linda Manzanilla. I'm quite sure there are plenty of more questions, I mean, about education, science at that time, but that will be probably uh, an open space for, for, for our next conference. Once again, Professor Linda Manzanilla, thank you very much for your time and for a wonderful uh, presentation, and thank you to the audience. Thank you for the invitation.